Hello reviews some of the most important research in the field of environmental justice, and I provide wider discussions for more generality in this phenomenon. Let's uh, move on. They're, they're saying that there's no natural hierarchy in anything. So what they want to say, if we talk about race and ethnicity, we need to talk about a racial formation. It says Omi Wanat in the 1980s defined racial formation as the process by which social, economic, and political forces determine the content and importance of racial categories. I have some pictures later from the United States before desegregation. You know, you definitely see social, economic, and political forces determining the social importance of skin color. The same for apartheid in South Africa. Formally, there was a white and black difference. Uh, these groups uh, introduced the term racialization to describe the extension of ethnic or racial meaning to a previously unclassified relationship. Now, slavery is not naturally a racial category. It is racialized. That is my example there. It's racialized by European expansion and European empires across Africa, extending the occupational category of slavery to only people of a certain skin color, and then formalizing that, that only these people can be slaves, is a different matter. This is an ideological stratification in addition to an occupational stratification, and any hierarchy with an ethnic issue tends to be an ideological project of some groups over others. And their term racial project captures the essence of political struggles between different ethnic groups to dominate or to define the other. Um, another book, which I don't really have time to discuss, is called Revolutionary Atlantic. The origins of nationalism we're really fighting against a non-ethnic based democracy. Whether look at England, France, or the United States, early movements in the 1700s were blind for color. Everybody wanted participation, and everybody worked together on this. Then, certain elites began to make appeals that we can't allow this group to dominate us. And so many nationalisms did not develop by themselves. They developed in reaction against this really class-based, multi-ethnic movements that you see around Europe and the United States. So um, it's really called Secret History of the Revolutionary Atlantic. But if you search for Revolutionary Atlantic, it's a very good read on the origins of national projects, uh, you know, racial projects. This is the picture of skulls. It's a picture of buffalo skulls. Uh, as the United States moved across North America from only the East Coast to the West Coast, it had to destroy 500 different cultures. And many of them rely on the Plains area on buffalo. So part of removing the buffalo was really to destroy a culture and to destroy a region. This is a huge pile of a man standing on top of the buffalo and other people down here. All these are heads. They're just heads of the buffalo, which are big cows, really. But they roamed over most of the United States, and different native cultures were tied into them in space. So if you wanted to remove people, you remove their ability to live in that area. Um, if you're curious, we don't have time to look at it, but go to TED.com and look up Aaron Huey. And there's a Korean and Chinese translation of this. It's the discussion of environmental racism with pictures of how most Native Americans live today in very terrible conditions on marginal lands. Here is a racial hierarchy formation. This just takes one minute. Here is the United States. Great Britain is in yellow. France is in. Green, green's gone, France is already gone, Spain is in red, Russia is in black, here's France, and suddenly the US buys that. So you have one particular racial project tending to move across versus the others. So covering hundreds and hundreds of local groups. Mexico gains independence, but then you know, the United States begins to bite Mexico and continues to bite Mexico until it has California as well. But moving over this area, you still have huge numbers of Spanish population. 
Spanish-Mexican population. So it's, there's definitely a racial division within this area of the United States, but it's not white over black. It tends to be Anglo-white over Mexican, who were there originally. They were there originally. And I will stop it here. Canada does the same thing. Um, you can also think about Australian Aborigines and the land that the British wanted. There's lots of minerals available there. New Zealand, we looked at New Zealand's Maori. The domination of that land, New Zealand's native population is reduced to a minority underclass, tending to living in worse conditions than people of a different skin color. Racial formation, you know, it was difficult for the people who were migrants within China to become integrated into the Chinese society. This is the ethnic Hakka people map from something I've discussed before, showing where, where these itinerant moving peoples were and the early Soviet support, early support for communism. So the people who had nothing to lose were the first supporter of regions for Maoism and things like that. Environmental racism in class, page 149 of Perro Inequalities impact populations in a relational fashion. That is, one group's access to clean living and working environments is often made possible by the restriction of another group's access to those same amenities. Uh, when I worked at Iwa Wu University, the area behind Seoul was a huge shock because it had this very wealthy university, and then look over the edge of this wall, and it's a slum right next to it. Chinese in Seoul, Koreans in China, different contexts of dominance that way. Uh, when people of color are concentrated in toxic jobs, this suggests that these populations occupy a position of inferiority against ethnically dominant and class dominant communities. Uh, these practices serve to maintain these privileges over the next generation. Um, South African apartheid started in the diamond mines. It was the owner, Rhodes, Rhodes' idea to segregate diamond workers and make them all black and the overseers would be white. And Rhodes later became very politically powerful within South Africa and the structure of space that he organized in diamond mines, he began to apply to the rest of South Africa. So it didn't come from a culture, it's a project. And later people grow up in that project and think it's natural. That's one of the huge problems. Um, this is a picture from South Africa. It says, for use by white persons, these public premises and the amenities thereof have been spurred for the exclusive use of white persons by order of provincial secretary. And then it's in Afrikaans, which is Dutch, uh, Dutch version. This is the city of Durban. Durban is a city in South Africa. Under section 37 of the Durban Beach Bylaws, this bathing area is reserved for the sole use of members of the white race group. It's in several languages. Um, but these are areas of South Africa where different populations live. Those are the black homelands, which are away in marginal areas. So the good lands began to be dominated by other people. So here's small enclaves of white populations in dominating major cities and the capital zone. Native in Indians from India were over here. Blacks tended to be congregated here. And what their definition of colors was was a lighter color. So this, the super color of black, you know, it wasn't just black, but you're divided into multiple categories. And people were given different space for that. This is in 1992, after the last president, the clerk of the apartheid government, is beginning to deconstruct the racial project. He's shaking hands with the later president of uh, South Africa. Whose name escapes me actually? Right? What's his name? Um, President of South. It's totally for, to have slipped my mind. Um, anyway, color waiting room. This is the United States. Organization of space under segregation. There are certain places for white people and certain places for black people. And this goes for consumption. It also goes for Spanish people. As I told you, the U.S. expanded as a racial project over different groups. Um, here's officially the way it looked in 1950. 1950 was, um, 1954 actually is this 
Brown versus Board of Education. That's when segregation was declared unconstitutional. You couldn't be legal anymore. It's required. Even if you're not racist, you're required to not allow them into this job. You're, you're support that system. This is a racial project. You know, some places had prohibitions. You know, some states, they did not allow. But there were many different variations. No specific legislation. So most of the U.S. had no laws against segregation. It was just this tiny area that had laws against segregation before 1950 or 1954. And after this, there was school desegregation. And after that, there was a lot of people leaving cities who were white. So there was pre-segregation, particularly in education in the United States. Um, the city of Atlanta is now more stratified by class and race than ever before. Um, so it doesn't go away. This is a durable problem. Um, this is the Barack I think it was 1850. And Barack Amin are in red. They're not allowed in the middle of the city. They're the dirty people. They're classified as dirty. And eight years later, a better detailed map it's still the same way. They're outside the main walls, the main moat. And I showed you a map where people still remember this. Um, it's the ethnic map of New York City. You can see people stratifying based on ethnicity. This is Detroit that we've looked at before. Um, blue is a black American. You can see one central business district, which is dominated by uh, white ethnicity. I think this is Mexican over here, so there's different sections of Detroit. Um, Minneapolis, St. Paul, there's a few black zones uh, within those major cities uh, in the north of the United States. This is a kind of rainbow, it's a, a blur mixture in Long Beach, California, but you still see decided differences based on space. Um, Ireland, we can think about that, forced conversion to Catholicism. If you refuse that in the British project, you lost your land. So the Irish were not naturally poor. They refused to adopt the religion of their conquerors. And they were forced into a lower class context because of that. Um, on the website, download this if you're curious. This is Mandy Coe's Red Shoes. It's a book of pictures. It's a book without words. And it describes gender and ethnic hierarchies and space very well. Space, gender, and ethnicity are described very well in pictures. So how conquest occurs in space. It's the red shoes versus the black shoes people, and the black shoes are coming to conquer, and then the black shoe people have conquered the red shoe people. They reduce them to a small space. Um, they, can, they have to, you know, you wait bye-bye, you have to go work in another society. Um, you're in a special line, you're classified as that special group, um, the society you're in is totally foreign to you, you're all enjoying the black shoe lifestyle, your window has a, somebody threw a brick through it. Um, these are just a few images from that book. Um, it's a very subtle book dealing with lots of stratification, you know, different levels of justice for different ethnic groups. Um, separation in public events, um, separation in parties, relaxing. Uh, you work for someone else with different ethnicity. Some people get a diploma, other people get the wrench, um, stratified. You hide in the military, and then you fire your own people. There's so many places around the world we can talk about. Um, anyway, the last thing I want to say is this. It says, linking racial formation with different hierarchies, one can argue that the exploitation of people of color, really racialized underclasses, and natural resources has been tied together throughout world history and remains the foundation of racial domination. So he's saying the reason this happens is not because people don't like the other person. They want access to the space. They want access to the materials. And once they conquer an area, they cannot allow those people any equal representation, or their dominance of those resources would be destroyed. Um, so we begin to see environmental racism not merely as an extension of racism, but a form of racist practice, but the core of racism, stealing materials from others with violence, and later denying them. 
institutional, political, cultural, and social feedback in the institution. 